Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I drank alcohol until I achieved pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization, bought myself a bag of dope and a Harley Davidson, and became a legend in my own mind. <laughs> I know there's some other legends in here because you can feel them, you know. <laughs> They're all the ones with all the answers to all the questions, you know. I'm a fourth generation alcoholic. My old man's an alcoholic. His old man's an alcoholic. His old man's an alcoholic. And that didn't make me an alcoholic because I didn't want to be like them, but it gave me enough facts and circumstantial evidence that I'm right where I belong. The magic of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is that today <clears throat> my father is a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous and I have 14 months of seniority on that sucker and I don't ever let him forget it. <clears throat> <clears throat> throat> the beauty of the whole deal is that he's just my old man. He's just my old man, and that's the rigorous honesty of this program. And uh, that's all I ever wanted him to be. He's a lawyer, and I always needed a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> I told him one time, it just seems to me like every time we talk, you're interrogating me. And he said, I was. You needed... <clears throat> so today he's just my old man, and I'm grateful for that. And uh, that's the simplicity, and those are the things that I've been able to see since I've been here, but it wasn't what I came here for. I was born in Texas, and that doesn't necessarily make you an alcoholic, but it gives you a lot of character defects. You pour a little Jack Daniels on it, why I always got old loud mouth and got weird, and therefore drinking was a contact sport for me. I, I kept running into a lot of things. Uh, it also gave me the ability to recognize all your character defects and an untenable need to tell you about them, too. And that always got me in a lot of trouble. Uh, and I have a few character defects that have caused me an awful lot of pain. One of them is you can line ten women against that wall over there, and I'll get the sickest one every time. <clears throat> I, uh, I love sick women. Uh, I did a lot of speed. I'm a speed freak. That's like going 150 miles an hour with your feet nailed to the floor. And uh, you got to have a crazy woman because speed freaks don't have time to pack, you know. I mean, they're just going someplace all the time. I married one that wasn't sick once, and after nine months of that relationship, her daddy was one of the ten richest men in the state of Texas, and he didn't get that way making bad investments, and after nine months in that relationship, they called me in and discovered that I was a bad investment and threw me away. And I said I'd never, ever, I mean, by God, ever fall in love again, and I didn't for a little while. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I was standing around a little country dance one Saturday night not doing nothing, and uh, come... 12 o'clock intermission, the band taking intermission. I didn't do nothing. Me and all my friends were leaning up against the wall. I'd take a Coke bottle and roll it down the end of that dance floor and say, let the meanest sucker in the house bring it back. And sometimes it looked like a stampede coming my direction. <laughs> and I'd hit the first guy leading the charge because he's stupid enough to do that. I got him first and split. Now, I'm not one of those guys who come to Alcoholics Anonymous who lost a lot of fights. The trick is you don't stay around until they're over. You know? <laughs> And I'd hit somebody and split, and at that time I was hiding in the woman's restroom. And uh, I took off running for the woman's restroom, went by this blonde-headed lady, and I said, tell me when the fight's over. And I run in there, and pretty soon she stuck her head in and said, you can come out now, cowboy. And I thought it was very nice of her. I found out later she finished the fight for me. <clears throat> but I'm a quick study. Don't take me long to find out what I need to know. And one quick dance, I found out she had a car, she had a driver's license, she had a place to stay, she had a job, and I fell in love because it met all the requirements. <clears throat> the state of Texas had taken my driver's license away forever. I just got out of doing 18 months down in South Texas for something that I was a victim of circumstances for. I didn't have a job, didn't have any money, didn't have anything going for me. And she had all the requirements, and I asked her to take me home with her. Now, we didn't fall in love immediately. We fell in sick with each other. That's where the rocks in my head fit the holes in hers. <clears throat> <clears throat> I didn't want to rush into anything, so we didn't. We kind of pontificated the residue for a couple of years there. And at the end of a couple of years, I didn't have anything going for me any more than I did when I first met her. I didn't have a job, didn't have nothing going for me. And, and she gave me an ultimatum, wanted to get married, so we did, and I did. And, and uh, along came a little girl, and... Uh, responsibilities. Now, I don't know anything about responsibilities. They always got in the way of my drinking. 
I don't know anything about being a husband or a father or an employee or any of those kind of things. I just never did enjoy that. It always had something to do with being responsible and showing up and authority, and I never liked authority or never liked responsibility or showing up. But I found myself with this wife and this little girl and a few other things that go along with those kind of deals, like you gotta you got to act like you're doing what everybody else is doing based on what it is that they tell you that you're supposed to do, which means I went and got a house, and I went and got a dog and a cat, and I had this kid and I had this woman. Now, I can go over to your house and get a dog out of the litter, and I'll get the sickest dog in the whole damn litter. I go over there to get an Easter bunny, and I get the one with a ringworm, man. I... <clears throat> <clears throat> and I ended up with this 120-pound German Shepherd dog that hated my ass, boy. <clears throat> I took him to an obedience class, and we both got kicked out for being violent, you know. I got this damn Siamese cat, and they sent me one more and hung over down to get this cat neutered, and I don't know what they did to her, but it pissed her off, man. And I should have got her declawed. <clears throat> And I'd go off and do my thing because I had to go off and do my thing. I'm one of those that went a lot of places and did a lot of things. And then I'd come home, and there she'd be like her damn mouth was attached to the doorknob, and she'd be yelling and screaming. The kid would be bawling, the dog would be biting me in the ass, and the cat would be scratching me. And I'm just trying to say, hell, daddy's home, you know. I, <clears throat> I come a long way to do what I'm supposed to do. She always wanted to talk to me about what it was I was supposed to do, and she always knew more about what it was that I'd been doing than I did, and I didn't like talking to anybody who knew more about what I'd been doing than I did. And therefore, the conversations uh, never did have a very much meaning to them. But, uh, you know, I didn't realize what was going on in my life. I just was doing what I had to do, and I'm that kind of a guy. I don't know. I hear a lot of alcoholics, you know, talk about the fact that they never fit in and they never, they always felt different. I'm an egotist. My problem was I wanted you all to march to my tune. My frustration and anxiety was is when I all got you all marching to that damn tune, then all of a sudden you'd turn to the right or left just when I was about to make my big deal. And it made me angry and frustrated. And I probably felt different. But I just gathered up another bunch and started all over, you know. And I kept finding myself out in front of the pack with nobody following and uh, that's lonely out there. You have to gather up more people. And after some period of time, it became necessary for me to do what the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous calls a geographic. I had to move from Texas. Now, in Texas, they call that unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Uh, <coughs> uh, the heat was on. I had to get the hell out of Texas, and I gathered up this crazy lady and his kid and dog and cat and everything we had, and we headed for California because the guy offered me a job in California. Now, I left Texas. I'd worked in the oil business, oil fields, and I wanted to get the hell out of the oil fields, so I went to California, and I went to work in the oil fields. You know, it makes sense. guy bet me 50 bucks one time I couldn't drink a quart of motor oil, and I did. That was kind of my resume, you know what I mean? I figured, what the hell? I think I'll get in the oil business, you know what I mean? Things like that always made sense to me. The problem was, everywhere I went, I took me, and I'm the first to get there. I got arrested just as soon as I got to California. had this crazy woman, and bunch of weird, weird things following me around, and I got to California, got busted just as soon as I pulled into California, because I was somewhere along the trip, I tore the mirror off the right side of this car, we had all our stuff in, and I had her hanging out the damn window trying to see if anybody's over in that lane, and they said, you don't have human rear view mirrors in California, you know, <clears throat> and uh, I found a drunken uncle, and I got me a place to live that was perfect for me, it was an old house nobody lived in for a couple of years. And uh, there was a bunch of dope fiends living next door to me, AWOL from Marine El Toro Base. They'd do LSD and lay in the front yard and watch the sun come up and go down. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting. <clears throat> Never seen nothing like that in Texas, you know. The motorcycle gang lived on the other side of me, you know, my kind of people. And I took up residency there and put this woman and kid and the dog and the cat there. And all the Christians lived on the other side of the street. You know, we're that kind of people, you know. I always identified with my friend David, you know. You, you get over there where all of them on that side of the street and you drink the right stuff over on your side of the street, you can transpose yourself into being just what it is they are over there. And I was sitting in my garage one day drinking some beer and smoking a little weed, kind of fantasizing about what it was I was going to do. And my neighbor across the street came over and he said, I'd like to paint your house. I said, why? He said, well, I just want to paint your house. And I said, well, what color? 
I'd had trouble figuring out what color to paint it. I had one end blue, one end green, one side was brown, one side was, you know, whatever it was, the end of the gun kind of clogged up. You know, I, my attention span was real short. I couldn't <laughs> get interested in things too long, and I had a little trouble, and I said, if you can figure out what color to paint my house, I'll let you paint it. And he figured a color out, and I said, why do you want to paint my house? And he said, well, he's going to put his up for sale over on the other side of the street because he's going to get the hell out of the neighborhood before my side infected his side, you know. <clears throat> And he did. He painted my house, and I sat right there and watched him do it, you know. I said, hell, they're working for me, you know. And I'd have to leave and go off and do whatever it was that I had to do and work, and I'd go off to Louisiana or Alaska someplace and work five or six weeks. I'd come back home, and I'd get up there to the house and have to make a decision whether I'm going to go in the front or the back. She was always in the front, crazier than hell, just waiting right there. I'd be gone five or six weeks, and it's like she never moved. You know, I'd get up there, and there she'd be yelling and screaming at me. I took up carrying this 12-inch butcher knife, always trying to stab me with this butcher knife. Now, I like guns. Guns will enhance conversation. <laughs> they will. You can shoot a 44 mag off next to somebody's ear, and they'll pay attention to you. <laughs> they won't hear nothing, but they'll pay attention to you. <clears throat> But this woman was not afraid of guns, and I could stick this gun right up there. Man, I stuck a cannon over her nose and yelled and screamed at her. One time I stuck a 38 right in her mouth, and she's yelling and screaming. I said, you're crazy. She said, you go first. <laughs> the hell, I'll kill you. She said, I know, but the momentum will knock me back, and I'll stick this knife in you on the way back. You know what I mean? Samurai warriors train all their life to be able to get the last cut and the kill in, and a pre allen knows that intuitively from the beginning, you know? <laughs> Always watering my booze down. I brought a buddy home one time. We went in. I got a quart of vodka out from underneath the sink. I had a hid down there. Took two big iced tea glasses. Poured that stuff in there. Half a quart in each one. Hit it with a little bit of Tabasco. So we call her Bloody Mary. My friend, I shoved him a glass over. He took that thing, drank half that glass, set it down. He said, man, he said, you know, I'm either the meanest son of a bitch in town or that's the smoothest vodka I ever tasted. <laughs> I knew she'd watered her down one more time, you know. I'd get up finally get things settled down. You know, I, I tried to be responsible. I had things that other people had, I suppose. I tried to do those things, but my interest just wasn't there. I had to do things weird, different. Like, I like to mow my yard at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> I like to wake up because I always woke up quick, man. I mean, you take the stuff I did, you wake up quick. Run out in the kitchen, man, get your blender out and put about 100 mini bennies in there and a little orange juice, a couple of raw eggs, something to get your heart started. Pour you a big glass of vodka, hit it a couple of times with some Tabasco so you call it a Bloody Mary. Pour that stuff down in there and let her get cooking two inches behind your belly button. Go out in the garage and see if you can find a lawnmower out there underneath something, you know. About 20 minutes goes by, all that stuff kicks off. You can find a lawnmower, but if you can't find a rope, don't make no difference because you can push start that sucker, man. <laughs> get her out in the front yard. I like to mow my front yard at 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I didn't have a front yard. <laughs> I had front dirt. I like to mow front dirt. If you got front dirt, you don't need a grass catcher, you know. <clears throat> Didn't have any muffler on my mower because I like to mow that. So all my neighbors would know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing and get out there. One morning my mower died, and I figured it must have been something I brought from Texas. If it don't run, kill it. I brought a hole in my mower with a 44 mag at 5 o'clock in the morning. One morning, I wasn't mad at Sears. The mower just died. And the cops come, and they want to talk to me about what it was I was doing, and I didn't want to talk to them, and they'd run my head into their nightstick five or six times. <clears throat> and then she'd come running out and tell them, don't take him away. You know, he's got all these things to do. The sink don't work and all this and that. And I'm thinking, hell, take me away. I'd be better. I'd be safer with them if I was here at the house, you know. <clears throat> and then they'd calm down, and I'd get back in the house, you know, and what goes up must come down, you know. And I'd get a little depression coming on, and I'd go in there and get my old chair out. I had an old recliner in my room, my room in there, where you could lay in there and drink a little wine. I like Red Mountain wine long about 8 o'clock in the morning. You know, it just kind of takes you down there and warms her up. You can kind of wallow in self-pity, you know. <laughs> I had an old Winchester 97 shotgun laying beside the chair. I'd get her out and sawed off right in front of the pump, and I'd get her out and cock her and stick the barrel in my mouth and click the trigger. It's empty, of course. I wasn't going to commit suicide until the crowd got there. No. <laughs> they'd line up on their line of contempt, her and the kid and the dog and the cat, and they'd look at me with that sorry look, you know, like, oh, you sick son of a bitch. You know? 
One time I jacked that gun back just getting ready to stick it in my mouth, and I seen some red go by. I thought, I wonder what the hell that was, you know, and I pulled over to the side and pulled that trigger. Man, that woman put a shell in that gun, tried to kill me. <laughs> Blow the air conditioner clear out of the wall, man. <clears throat> Couldn't hear out of that ear for two or three weeks. A couple of days later, it dawned if my neighbor had been walking by, I'd have blown him away, you know. <laughs> then the cops come, run my head into their nightstick five or six times, and I'd have to get everything calmed down. Then you got to make the great escape. Got to figure out how to get out of there. By then, it's 11 or 12 o'clock Saturday morning, you know. And I'd see her purse over there. Usually my vehicle wasn't in too good a shape getting home Friday night from wherever it was I was coming from, but I'd try to make it in her car, and I, she had her keys and her purse and everything over there by the door, kept it there all the time. I'd make a mad dash, grab that purse, run out, get in her car, get the ignition key in there, and get her started, throw it in gear, turn around so I didn't hit somebody behind me, and turn back down as I go down that driveway and look back, and there she'd be on the hood, banging on the windshield. I don't know if there's any hood riders in here or not. But that'll sober an old drunk up. You got a crazy woman on the hood, beating on the hood, man. You got to pull back up the driveway, drag her off the hood. The kid's bawling, the dog's biting in the ass, and the cat's running around there crazy, and the dope fiend neighbors come over, and the cops coming, and the dope fiend neighbors call the cops pigs. I said, don't call the cops pigs when they're beating on me. I don't do that to you. <laughs> Then they get that van that's got the funny sports coat that ties in the back. I never was cool in a straight jacket in my front yard. And they put me in a van, take me down the nut ward, and take me in one of them funny rooms and smile at you. One time they tied me down on one of them tables. I was laying there in a four, four point restraint, yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming, yelling and screaming. I thought, I wonder why I'm yelling and screaming. I stopped screaming, and I listened, and everybody else that was tied down on them tables was screaming, and I didn't want to be different, so I screamed. <laughs> <clears throat> Took me over there one time, and I called her up and said, you've been, you put me back in the nut ward, I'm not crazy. You got to get me out of this nut ward, and if you don't, I'm going to kill you. And she hung up, and I tore the phone off the wall in the nut ward. That's good for 72 more hours of observation when you do that. I'd been there I don't know how many times, a bunch of times, and I figured, well, i got to have a story for these psychiatrists. They called me in there, and they told me, they said, you know, we, don't, we can't figure out what's the matter with you. You have symptoms of a lot of different things. I thought, you ought to be in here where I'm at, man. <clears throat> I, but I knew one thing. I'd been there enough I had to get a story going pretty quick, or they're going to put me away forever. And I told them, I said, I know what it was. I was in the big war. I went and I joined this, you know, this deal and they got me in this thing and trained me and they took me all through these things and they put this parachute on me and they got me in this airplane and they took me up, I don't know, 15, 20,000 feet in the air and I, everybody was jumping out the door and I froze right in the door and somebody shoved me out the door and had all this stuff on my back and I fell, I don't know, 15, 20,000 feet and my shoe didn't open and I landed a tree, flung me over and I lit on my head and I laid there, I don't know how long some people come got me, took me over here and then they got me, took me over there and then they put me in this hospital and they brought me back to the States and Put me in this hospital, and these doctors give me these little pills. When I take these little pills and drink whiskey, I go crazy. This doctor looked at me, and he said, just a minute. And uh, he went and called my wife up. He said, I think he's in the wrong hospital. He ought to be down to VA hospital. And she said, what the hell for? He's never been in the service, you know. <laughs> Man, just when I had a good story, she wouldn't go along with it. And they come back and told me, said, you're a walking encyclopedia of worthless information. But they gave me a little card said I was crazy, and... That didn't make a big deal there. They said I could come back and stick it into that slot any time I wanted to. Now, I'm not stupid, man. I know if you stick that card in that slot, it'll let you in there where there's no doorknobs on the inside of it. <laughs> <clears throat> but it impressed my friends. I became a card-carrying nut. That'll get you nicknames like Animal and Psycho, things like that. And I became a card-carrying nut immediately. Now, you know, that's when I was a social drinker. I, I consider anything prior to going to Alcoholics Anonymous social drinking for me. I had never been to Alcoholics Anonymous up to, including that time. And I found myself standing in front of a judge like I had many other times, and the judge was talking to me about going to the penitentiary for three to five years for something I didn't remember doing. And uh, I didn't know, you know, and he gave me an option and... Uh, said, you know, you can go to some AA here, we'll give you a little thing, and we'll let you go to some meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous for a period of time. 
and report to this parole officer, and he gave me a number to call. I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous, but I knew one thing. I didn't want to go to the penitentiary. I knew something about that, and I didn't want to go to the penitentiary. I was I'll go to AA, whatever. I went home, and I called this guy, and I said, you know, i got to go to a meeting. He told me there's one over by my house, gave me the address, and I laid down on the couch. And this crazy lady I lived with come home and gave me all this rap about going to a lawyer, and I'd heard that old crap. I said, well, i got to go to AA. They got a meeting tonight over by my house, and there it starts at 8.30, and it's over 10, and I laid down on the couch, and pretty soon she come running in there and stuck that butcher knife right in my face. I said, get up. I said, where are we going? She said, we're going to that meeting of AA. Okay. So we went over to this thing, and it was a church. It had one of them signs out front with two big AAs on it. Oh, Jesus, I've sunk to the bottom now. You know, look at that. <laughs> she said, what time's that meeting over? And I said, 10 o'clock. She said, I'm going to tell you something, fat boy. If your ass comes out of that door before 10 o'clock, I'm going to gut you. <laughs> now, I'll tell you something about a drunk like me. You can keep me sober for a period of time, especially if you've got a crazy woman waiting in the parking lot, because I respect that. But I'm going to tell you something, if you're new or nearly new, there ain't nothing worse than being in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous when you're not really an alcoholic. <laughs> you know that? When you're not really, 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 I mean, by God, really an alcoholic, you're not really an alcoholic. And I sat in that meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I proved I was not an alcoholic. Because the first step of Alcoholics Anonymous says you're powerless over alcohol and that your life will be, you know, is unmanageable. And after going to one meeting a week for four months, I proved that my life was not unmanageable. I sat there and I was thinking, you know, hell, I beat the deal down at the courthouse. I got a job going. You know, I'm sitting here in the house. The old dog's laying next to me. Pat the dog on the head. He's smiling. The cat's in my lap, burning. Pat the kid on the head over here. The kid's okay. She's in the kitchen. I'm back in the big bedroom and everything's fine. I thought, hell, I've been too hard on myself. I've prematurely gone to Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, I know someday I'll be over there, but I'll be old, for Christ's sake, you know. <clears throat> And I resigned from Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> and uh, I got struck drunk almost immediately. <laughs> you know, in the next three and a half, four years of my drinking and using, there's nothing cute or funny about it because it was nothing but living, screaming hell. Because there's nothing worse than being out there with a head full of AA and belly full of booze and arm full of dope. It makes you crazy. You remember things that you heard in AA. Now, I never heard a lot of things in AA, but I remembered some things long about 8, 8.30 in them evenings. I remember some old fool saying, we won't guarantee you've had your last drink, but we'll guarantee you'll never enjoy another one. <laughs> you remember things like that when you're out there drinking after you've been to AA, you know. <clears throat> and a lot of things happened to me. You know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says we're supposed to share what it used to be like, what happened, and what it's like today. And I hear a lot of people share what it used to be like and what it's like today. There's a very significant thing there, the what happened. And it's something that the alcoholic ego would rather forget. But it is very important and very significant. And it is the greatest reference point of my life. Because I'm the kind of an alcoholic, as long as there's one man, woman, child, dog, or cat that'll roll over when I snap my fingers, I won't look at me. As long as I can step on your back. To step me up one notch, I won't look at me. And that's just the way it is. And my what happened lasted three and a half to four years. In the next three and a half, four years, many, many things happened to me. And I don't share them with you so that I might make you think I'm something that I'm not. I share them with you simply because my sponsors and the Foundation of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that I must share with you what it used to be like because my my past is my greatest asset that I might not set ever in any meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and reflect back on my past and think it was just a bad period because the last three and a half, four years of my drinking, I did a lot of things. You see, you can take everything away from a human being. They'll still be a human being. You can take money, property, prestige, people, places, and things out of people's life. You can take that out of my life and I'm still a human being. But once you take away my dignity, I've got nothing left to lose, and I'm as near an animal as a human being can be. And I, in that last years of my drinking, I convinced psychiatrists that I was a sociopath, someone who has no conscience. I stood in front of a judge, and he talked to me about me, and he had the right guy. <clears throat> because as I slid down the wall of life, I took everything near and dear about me. 
I was arrested many times in that period of time for a lot of different things, but many times I was arrested for beating my wife and my daughter on a regular basis because they said they loved me. Just simply because they said they loved me. You can't love me. You can't love me. I don't love me. And if you say you love me, I've got to prove that you can't and that you don't. Because you see, a guy like me will attract all the things that I feared the most, not even knowing that I can attract the things I love the most. And I had to prove. And I don't mean one day or one week or one month, but for years. The umbrella of fear and hate and anger and rage. And there is some gray zone beyond hate. There's some, there is some nothingness, some way of living and thinking and breathing where there is no feelings, there is no hope, there is no God to our knowledge, where there is nothing, where this disease takes you and where it tells you on a regular basis that you're not nothing and you're never going to be nothing and you come to believe that. And I lived there and anybody that chose to be around me had to live there because I kept the umbrella of fear over my life and those about me. As I slid down the wall of life, it was necessary for me to prove myself to other people in order to match, in order to look and act and smell the way I had to believe that it was necessary for me to be. I prospected in one of the most notorious motorcycle gangs on the face of the earth just because that's where I went. And I sold my soul. I lied to you and I let you lie to me. In order to prove myself, it was necessary for me to take another man's life in order to prove that I could live and act and think like an animal. And I stood in front of a judge up in a little town in Nevada, and he talked to me about me, and he had the right guy. And he talked to me about living and thinking and acting like a, an animal. And I understood that. And he said, I can understand when you live and act and think like an animal, you got to defend yourself like an animal. And I know that the man that you took his life probably had to do the same thing, no doubt. And probably the earth is better off for the simple fact that he's no longer on it. But what I can't understand is how that you can beat another human being for 10 or 15 minutes after it's obvious to anyone that they're dead. And I wanted to scream out inside of me so loud, I wanted to say the wrong man died. It should have been me that died. It was supposed to be me that died, not him. And yet there was something silent inside of me. And I stood there like I had many, many times when people were talking to me about me, and I had no answer. I had no answer. What do you say? I don't have any more of an answer than standing there at 30 years old than I did whenever I was 12 years old and I just backed over my very best friend because I was somebody promised me they'd get me a six-pack of beer if I'd meet him someplace, and he got in the way. When I was 12 years old and I'm standing there and some judge is asking me, I can understand an accident where you back over your very best friend, but what I can't understand is you never even got out of the car to see how he was. You drove over him again. I didn't have any answer for that. What do you say? I really needed that beer after I did that. I didn't say that. I walled something up inside of me and it turned that knob a little tighter and it allowed me to turn those feelings off. You know, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says men and women drink essentially for the effect, and the effect after some period of time is that you cannot distinguish the difference between right and wrong, true or false. I love that feeling. I love that feeling where there is no conscience, where there is nothing, where you can walk out there on the face of this earth and you really don't care. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful today I'm just an alcoholic because there is a hopeless feeling to know when you're really convinced that there is no other way to live. I can remember, I don't know, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning standing in my kitchen and I'd take a drink out of a pint of vodka. I look down the hallway, a little nine-year-old girl standing down at the end of that hallway and she's looking at me and I'm looking at her. She don't run down that hallway and say, Daddy, will you come play with me? She didn't even say, please don't beat me and Mommy today. She looked at me and I looked at her. And I turned back around and I did what I had to do. I took a drink out of that bottle. Without a sound, I looked back. Without a sound, she was gone. She was just looking to see which direction I was going so she could go the other way. 
And she looked and smelled like she looked and smelled. She had her chin on her chest and her hair was in her face. And she had an old coat that she slept in all the time. It had a rotten Easter egg that had rolled around in the back and smashed in there in the lining. She had no friends. She had no enemies. There was a small animal crouched in a corner. And she had everything she had in two brown bags. And she carried a little purse around with her all the time that had the running money. And I remember one morning, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, I just cooked up some of that stuff and got it in a spoon and just put it in that syringe. And I was standing in my bathroom, and the door to that bathroom was cracked open six or eight inches, and there was a mirror on the wall. And I turned around, and I got ready to stick that needle in my arm. And I looked in that mirror, and a little nine-and-a-half-year-old girl was looking at me through the crack of that door. And just for a second, my eyes caught that little girl. And I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I was just what I was. And I knew there was nothing to say or nothing to do. And she looked at me and she didn't say, Daddy, will you come play with me today or will you please don't beat me and Mommy. She looked at me and I looked at her and I knew I was just what I thought I was. And there wasn't anything I could do about it. And I knew it had me. I didn't have it. And it wasn't going anywhere. And it wasn't staying any place. But it was what I got to do. And I turned around and I stuck that needle in my arm and without a sound, that little girl was gone. She was just looking to see which way I was going so she'd go the other way. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was the way I had to live. Because as long as there's anybody in my life that'll stand there and tell me they love me, I'll step on them in order to raise myself up out of the gutter. Because the alcoholic ego is an unbelievable thing. I remember sitting in my old pickup truck, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning one morning, said at a stoplight, and a man pulled up next to me in a car, man, and he had a nice set of threads on, and he was obviously one of them lames that works, you know, responsible. And I took a hit off a pot, pint of vodka. And I looked at him, and he looked at me sitting there at that light. And he looked at me at that look of contempt. And I turned at him, and I yelled at him, What the hell are you looking at me for? i got to have this drink just to get to the next stoplight. Just so I can get to the next stoplight. See, I had to live that way. I had to live that way. Not one day, not one week, not one month, but for years. Because that's the way it is for a guy like me. And it doesn't make any difference. That's the way it is. And the evil in that is beyond anybody's ability to explain it. Because I stole souls. I stole souls. And I knew that. You live with that. That's the nearest explanation of loneliness that I've ever seen or heard. To be so empty inside to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it does not make any difference what you put in you. You're still you, and you're not living, and you're not dying. And you live that way day in and day out. And it does not make any difference what's laying in front of you. If it's unattended, it's yours, because that's what you have to do in order to live the way you got to live. I know that that's where I had to go. And the damnable insanity of that and the rage as it races on has no ending to it. And the screaming inside of you when you stand silent and look at people when they're talking to you and you have no explanation for the actions that you've taken. There is no way to explain it. And there is no relief. And it gets to that point where you get no relief. And I can remember whenever it worked for 30 minutes. I can remember when it worked for 30 seconds. And I can remember when it did not make any difference what I put in me. It didn't work. My magic failed me. And the anger and the insanity that comes behind that kind of seeking relief puts a way of life that's beyond explanation. It is a disease. And it destroys all feelings and all knowledge of what's right and wrong. And on my last drunk, I hid out in a motel room for over a hundred days. <clears throat> At the end of a hundred days, I crawled out of that motel room because I couldn't stand me anymore. There was two different groups of people that had a contract on my life, and it was better for me to crawl out of that room and allow them to have a piece of my life than for me to live the way I was. I couldn't stand me anymore. I'd rolled around in that bed until there was no skin on my arms or my knees. And I'd shot holes in the walls in that room. And I couldn't stand me anymore, and I'd crawl out of there. By the grace of a loving God, in a program called Alcoholics Anonymous, there was people. There was people who prayed. Those prayers were not in vain. 
<clears throat> I crawled out of that room and I came home one more time and through a series of events and a little gray-headed man who believed in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and believed in what they call a 12-step call, he came to my house and he, he gave to me what I look for and never drink, pill or fix. I didn't know it. And I'm not going to tell you, I met him at the front door and embraced him and said, I've been waiting for you. I met him at the front door and stuck a 357 right in his nose and he did something he'd never done before or since. He took that gun out of my hand and he said, now if you're going to commit suicide, he threw it over on the couch and he said, I'll wait, you got a crowd. He said, but if you want to do something, I'll tell you how to do it. He said, I'll tell you how to live one day at a time for the rest of your life without taking a drink or using any kind of narcotics. And he said, I'll give you one thing even better than that. He said, I'll give you a way of living that you'll never have to be lonely again as long as you live. Now, I don't know how to live one second without sticking something in me at that point in my life. But I didn't know how you could possibly live without the loneliness, the insanity of that loneliness. And for some reason, I believed that little gray-headed man, and I followed him into the other room. And he did something that all 12-step calls are magnificent for, that is giving the faith and the strength and the courage for somebody, a complete stranger, to walk into somebody else's life and take him by the hand and he led me like a little lamb. And I followed him around for the next three or four hours. And they put me in a detox finally. And they took all my clothes off and they gave me one of them weird robes, you know, that's covered in the front and naked in the back and set me down on one of them cold couches and said, you're going to be fine. And I sat there and radiated hate because I was what I thought I was. And this little gray-headed man went back to my house and he explained to my wife and my daughter a way of living that has been the greatest thing that's ever happened to them. And I'd like to tell you, I just sat over there in that detox, just wonderful. All of a sudden, the next day, some people started coming over there talking to me about things, and this weirdo showed up with a fancy set of clothes and a big diamond ring, and he walked in there with a big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and said, Are you an alcoholic? I said, Hell, I don't know. Seems like the thing to be. I'm here. He said, Is your life unmanageable? And I said, Hell, I don't know. I don't have nothing to manage. He said, Are you crazy? And I said, I hope so. You know, it would be a step up for me. He said, do you believe in God? And I said, I don't know. I've been to the AA. I've been to them churches. I've been baptized, sprinkled, dipped, and sprayed, and it had never done nothing for me. What the hell? I said, I don't like going to them damn meetings, sitting in them kindergarten chairs with them crosses on the walls and all that stuff. I'm an atheist. And he went and got a dictionary and brought it back and looked up the definition of an atheist. And, hell, I didn't even understand it. And he said, see, you're going around saying you are something you don't even understand. He said, I want to tell you something. There's only one thing you need to know about God. And I said, okay, what? And he said, there is one, and you're not him. <laughs> Simplified it real quick. <clears throat> you know, the 12 and 12 in the next to the last paragraph, the step number one says that <clears throat> an alcoholic must hit a bottom before they're willing to do what's necessary to be done in the next 11 steps. Because what's necessary to be done in the next 11 steps is contradictory to anything that a drinking drunk would ever want to do. It says in that thing that you got to admit that you're insane and you can be restored to something. And I always said, how can you be restored to something you never had? If you can't do that anymore, you can come back from someplace you've never been. They said, well, you don't need to figure that out. And then it says you got to make a decision, turn your will and your life over to some power greater than yourself. And I didn't understand that. And they said, you don't need to understand that. And then he said, you got to write all that stuff down on paper and sign it and give it away to somebody else. My lawyers have been telling me forever, don't write it on paper and for God's sakes, don't sign it. And above all, don't tell anybody. <laughs> and then it says you got character defects and all my character defects had character. What the hell? And then it says you got to make a list of all the people that you've harmed who have harmed you and be willing to make amends. Now, if you had anything to do with me, you had to be a little bit wrong. Why do I got to go to you? I always rationalize things like that, even if I was 99% wrong and you were 1% wrong. It didn't make any difference. You were wrong. And it says you got to look at yourself every day. I put thousands of dollars worth of alcohol and dope in me to keep from looking at me every day. What the hell I want to look at me every day for? And then it says pray and meditate, and I didn't know anything about prayer. I tried that, and every time I meditated, I slipped into a sexual fantasy. I didn't know any how you're going to do that. <laughs> and then it says you got to give it away. I don't know any drunk that wants to give nothing away. <clears throat> so everything is predicated on the fact that you hit some bottom. And I found myself sitting in that alcoholic detox, and they told me, they asked me, said, how long did you drink and use? I said, 22 years. He said, well, you'll have to go to a meeting every day for 22 years before you can have a night off and go to a movie. You know? <laughs> I believed him. I had to get a sponsor. He said, you got to have a sponsor. You can't get out of this detox. I said, okay, smart ass. Will you be my sponsor? And he says, yes. 
and then he had a personality change right before my very eyes. <laughs> he turned out to be one of them sponsors that was more concerned for my life than whether I liked him or not. You know, them hard-hearted sponsors? His name was Rotten Ron. He was insane. <clears throat> And they gave me a big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, kicked me out of that detox, and I went home. There she was, standing at the door, you know, just like always. And I said, I've got to go to meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every damn day for the rest of my life. What are you going to do? And she says, oh, I've been going to al -Anon. The kid's been going to al -Ateen. The dog's been going to al dog And the cat's been going to al cat What the hell are you going to do? <laughs> I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> I went and called my sponsor, and he said, don't do anything. And he come and got me, you know, and I was riding to meetings all the time with this crazy guy. And I'd say... Talk to me about God. He'd say, see that guy standing over there? And I'd say, yeah. He says, I don't want to kill him. I said, hell, I don't want to kill him either. I don't even know him. He said, good, that's spiritual for us. And the light had changed and we'd go on, you know. <clears throat> oh, okay. I mean, for a guy that, you know, my greatest ambition was like it, make at least one enemy a day, you know. And we were going to meetings all the time. I, You know, the book says waves of the past will roll over you, man. I owed a lot of money. And it was due. <clears throat> and I owed some money to some people who want their money. Sobriety, physical sobriety didn't make a damn to them. You either get the money or you ain't got nothing. You're buried, you know. And so I started having to make some amends. And I went to my sponsor and I told him, i got to make this amends. I had to borrow $265,000 from a guy that hated me. That'll get you right with Jesus, I'll guarantee you. <clears throat> I went and lied to him like hell and told him I needed this money, and he said he'd loan it to me, and he'd give me a certain amount of time to pay it back, and told me if I missed one payment, he'd kill me. You know, resentments are good for some people, but <clears throat> that's an incentive to go to work, too, by the way. <clears throat> I'd hear people sitting around meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was new, and they'd talk about, I don't know if I want to go to work or not, and I think, by God, if you had fallen him, what's fallen me, you'll go to work, you know. <clears throat> But I told my sponsor, I said, I'll pay all this back, but don't tell me how to get the money. And my sponsor just kind of smiled at me. He said, oh, you figure it out. You, you'll figure it out. Amazing thing about an alcoholic, man. You know, when you're 30 days or less sobriety where I go to meetings, they make you stand up and acknowledge yourself. They call you a newcomer. And the reason we ask you to stand up is because we want you to know that we know you don't know shit about shit. <laughs> But an amazing thing happens. I see it all the time. As soon as you get 31 days, you know everything. You become significant. Yet it's the greatest reference point of an alcoholic's life. That point. Because the alcoholic ego will revive itself. It will revive itself irregardless of the length of sobriety. And it must be smashed. And you will repeatedly go back to that point of being a newcomer where you don't know nothing. We have no answers to any of the questions. Being a real alcoholic, as soon as I got about 30, 45 days, man, things started happening to me. I started getting it all together, and I went down and bought me a suit and got all shaped up. I hadn't shaved or cut my hair in a long time. I got shaved, cut my hair, cut me a suit of clothes, hung around this Alano club where my sponsor always had. He had a place he always sat. You know how them old timers do? They always sit there. Man, you want to make the vein pulsate, you go sit in their chair, man. They just eat. They don't have no name on it, but you can't sit there. But my sponsor always sit there, and he always made me stand across the room. And he'd point at me, look at him. So over three years without a change of attitude. Real attraction. But I showed him, man. I went down and bought myself a big Lincoln, bought myself a big Mark IV Lincoln, pulled it out in front of the Lano Club so the newcomers would have hope. By God. <laughs> Moving right along in AA. Standing over there in my corner of hate and radiating anxiety and hate, just dying inside, man. I ended up in an intensive care unit. Bled nine pints of blood low. I said, dry as a fire hazard, man. And people come over to see me, and the doctors are saying, you know, he's three years sober, and he's laying here. You know, I don't know what's wrong with him. He's bleeding to death inside, you know. And they told my wife, said, you know, if he'd have sneezed, he'd have had brain damage. She said, how would we have known the difference, you know what I mean? <laughs> Out of that hospital, I had to go to work. I was working all, chasing these oil rigs all over the damn world. I went off up in Wyoming, working up there, going to meetings in Evanston, Wyoming State Nut Ward. That'll make you grateful for your local meeting, I'll guarantee you, with all them people. But it'll make you a spiritual giant. And I come roaring back down from Wyoming down to California, run right in there and run in the house, run in and put my arm around my wife, and I said, get in the bedroom, I'm horny. She said, oh, no, I've been going down and I've discovered that you haven't made love to me in over ten years. 
You rape me on a regular basis. You're sleeping on the couch. Uh, geez, that's a hell of a way to treat a spiritual giant. <laughs> I went and laid down on the couch along about 12, 30, 1 o'clock. Them dope fiend neighbors started mowing their backyard. And she come running down the hallway and run in there on the couch and said, Oh, they're doing it out there. They're mowing the backyard. And I said, The hell they are. I run up and down there, grabbed my 44, run out and leaned over the fence and blowed them hippies lawnmower all to hell, man. They moved out just the next day or so. I was single-handedly cleaning up a neighborhood that had been corrupt for 20 years. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's the way I was. I didn't sober up and run right into Alcoholics Anonymous and everything just sweet and keno. I'm nuts because I don't have nothing in me, and I'm crazy running around here. I sat in my home meeting, a bunch of weirdos in there, and they'd share all the time. I'd judge them. One was sharing sick stuff. I took a bullet out of my gun, and I held a bullet up, and I wrote his name on there with a pen and tail pen while he was sharing. I said, I'm going to kill you right after the meeting. I appointed myself the executioner. Do that three or four times, the meeting would be over, and they'd all stand up and pray and put their arms around me and say, keep coming back, sicko. I'd forget which one of them was going to kill, and i think, hell, I'll come back next week and throw a grenade in here and get them all, you know. <clears throat> I stand around that club one day just radiating hate and I looked around, and a weirdo was standing next to me, the weirdest-looking guy you ever saw, man. I mean, he wasn't tall enough to be a man, he wasn't short enough to be a midget. Weird, had hair sticking everywhere, he had a weird hat on, had little cherries and strawberries on it like a welder's hat, and he had a pair of pants hitting about his knees. And he had a pair of thongs on, and he painted his feet black so it looked like he had socks on. I recognized that. I did it once, you know. <laughs> I looked at him, and I said, why don't you comb your hair? And he said, I did. And I said, hell, you did. Didn't look like it to me. I'm cool. I said, what the hell do you want? And he said, will you be my sponsor? I said, oh, shit, man. I said, I don't know. I'll have to ask my sponsor. I went over to my sponsor, Rotten Ron, standing over on the other side, and I said, see that weirdo over there? And he said, yeah. I said, he just asked me to be his sponsor. He says, I know. I sent him over there. Oh, shit, man. I told him, I said, at least you could have got a doctor or a lawyer or somebody. I'm cool, man. I'm three and a half years sober. I've cleaned up, man. And he said, no, he's just right for you. <laughs> you go tell him you'll be his sponsor and you do whatever he says. Now, I knew right away something was wrong when my sponsor told me I got to tell that guy I'll be his sponsor, but I got to do what that guy says I got to do. It didn't make sense to me, but I never argued with my sponsor. And I went back over there and I told that guy, I said, my sponsor says I got to be your sponsor. What do you want to do? He says, hell, I want to go for a ride in your Lincoln. Yeah. He wasn't stupid. I got that weirdo, and we started going to meetings, alcoholics, and I was riding around that Lincoln. He'd talk sick stuff to me, man. I mean, sick, sick, sick stuff. And he'd get going and talking and talking and talking, and then he'd say, did you ever do anything like that? And I'd say, yeah. And next thing you know, hell, I'm telling him some of my sick stuff. And then he'd say, boy, you're sick. You know that? <laughs> I think, I think I'm supposed to tell him what to do, but, uh, you know, let's go to a meeting. We'd go to a meeting, and we'd walk in, and people would just, boy, it's going to be fun to watch you two grow. <laughs> we showed them. <clears throat> One night after the meeting, we were sitting out in front of the club, and this guy wanted to talk to me about God all the time. He wanted to know about God. I didn't know about God. I couldn't explain God. I didn't understand God. I knew God had to be there because we was there and we was doing things that I didn't know what we were supposed to be doing. This guy kept saying, I need to know about God. And I said, I don't know about God. And he kept arguing with me about it. Finally, I opened up my glove box, took a forty-five out, jacked her back, put one hand on this side of his head, stuck it over on this side of the head, pressed the barrel so hard it pushed right into his skin. And I said, I'm going to count to ten. If the gun don't go off, there's a God. <laughs> I counted ten. The gun didn't go off. He looked at me. I put it back in the glove box. He jumped right out of that car, run right inside that Alano club, and showed them old-timers that ring on his... I said, you know what he did to me? And they said, yeah, we know what he does to people. <clears throat> he didn't drink. I didn't either. <clears throat> One Sunday morning, we'd moved out of the old neighborhood. That'll happen to you, too, if you keep doing the things you're doing. We moved out of the old neighborhood, come and knock at the front door. I went over to the front door, and there that weirdo was, standing right at my front door. He had the nerve to park his old car in my new driveway. You know, them newcomers' car always leaks oil. Six quarts oil by the time he got to my front door. Had stickers all over that sucker. AA, love Jesus, and all that stuff. You know, I thought, my neighbors know now, you know. <laughs> And he had an old big book with paper stuck in it, and it looked like one foot was caught in the concrete, and the other half of him was going to Tijuana. And I said, get in here quick before my neighbors see you. <laughs> I got him in, and he says, I want to work the steps like you did. And I thought, oh, gee. I said, well, I know the first step says we're powerless and our life's unmanageable. I know I'm powerless. I'll let you in. My life's unmanageable because it looks like you're going to stay. The second step says we're both nuts. I know you're nuts because I 
identify with you, so that means I'm nuts, so we must be on step three. You know? He said, how did you do step three? I said, well, I had to get on my knees with another human being and do that third step prayer. And he went right in the kitchen, got on his knees in the kitchen, and he said, get down here. Right? And I always thought, I think I'm supposed to be telling him what to do, but I got on my knees. We got that book, read that third step prayer, and he cuddled up underneath my arm, you know. And, oh, jeez, the cat walked by and looked at us weird. I thought, oh, man. <laughs> my wife comes down here and sees me and that weirdo down here on the floor, man. She'll know I've whacked out for sure. And he jumped up and says, now I want to do my fourth step. And I said, I got you now, sucker. You're supposed to have that done before you get to your sponsor's house. And he says, no, I can't write. And he sat down on the table there and took some papers out of that book and threw them over there. He says, I'll talk. You write. And he started talking. Hell, I started writing. You know, I wrote a bunch of that stuff down. You know, about an hour and a half went by. He said that stupid thing. He said, you ever do anything like that? And I said, yeah, I did. Matter of fact, and I started telling him some of my stuff. Matter of fact, a couple of things come up. I forgot to tell my sponsor. I knew God was in the room and he couldn't read. I just put some of my shit in his. What the hell? You know? <laughs> I felt good. Still do. <clears throat> <laughs> we burn it. He jumped up and ran around there and kissed me right on the cheek. And he said, I love you. And I thought, well, it's all over now. No. And he ran out in the front yard and waved that big book and said, I love you. And the neighbors knew, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> but you see, for the first time in my entire life, I experienced something that I never had experienced before because I was so into self. For the first time in my entire life, I got out of self. And I didn't judge that human being for what they were or what they'd done. And he shared some of his deepest, darkest secrets with me, and I shared some of mine with him. He had a couple of young daughters, and he told me about experiences that he'd gone through with them. And I shared experiences with him that I'd experienced with my own daughter. And we sat there that day, and he told me how he'd come to Alcoholics Anonymous, and one day he was sitting in his house, and his daughter came home and she crawled up in his lap and she had a little flower she'd made at school and she unfolded this flower and she said daddy I want to give you a flower that'll never die and I shared with him one day I don't know I was over a year and a half and my daughter came home and she'd taken a modeling course and I didn't know anything about it I'd just been going to AA meetings and doing what I had to do and she told me she said daddy you know they're having a deal come Saturday morning and we'd like for you I'd like for you to come down to this place and I said, well, I'll probably be doing this in AA or whatever, you know, but I'll come down there. And I remember going in this place, this big room, big department store upstairs, and had a great big room. And I walked in there and leaned up against the back of the wall back there, and there was a lot of people in that room, and I didn't know them. They didn't know me. And I looked up at the front, and there was a stage up there. And pretty soon a bunch of little girls come out on this stage, and my daughter was standing there with them, and she had a beautiful dress on. She had a smile, and she had a sparkle in her eye, and you know, I wanted to scream out to those people if you only knew the kind of animals we'd been, if you only knew where we come from, you know. But you see, I couldn't even say nothing. I could lean against that wall, but I couldn't say nothing because I couldn't take credit for that. Only the program of Alan and Alateen allowed that little girl the dignity to step out and do the things that she wanted to do. But I got to lean against that wall that day and cry those daddy tears. And they weren't tears of sorrow, they were tears of joy. And I got to share that with that dingling that day. And you know, me and that guy, we sat there and we cried. And they were not tears of sorrow. You know, two men like that expressing those kind of feelings, that, that's impossible. See, I don't know what love is. I don't know what, you know, I mean, I had somebody said, I love you. I just knew it meant I was next. You know, and I didn't understand those things. I didn't. And yet today I know what love is. Love is an action an action for a guy like me. And the first act of love is the act of transparency. I've got to let you see in so that I can see out. I know if I let you see in, if I have no secrets, even the things that are secret to me are not secret to you. And if I let you see in, then what that gives me is the freedom to be what I always wanted to be. The act of transparency. And that day that guy sat there with my house and me, him, and we shared those things. And I knew why it was necessary for me to take my fifth step because you see it's got to make full circle or you don't get it. The reason I'd taken my fifth step with my sponsor is because it qualified me to receive a fifth step, and it is only in forgiving that we are forgiven. You can sit around here and die sober if it don't make full circle. It's got to make full circle. I could sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and radiate that hate and lean against that back wall of hate, and I knew it was like it was tattooed on my forehead. You ain't nothing. You ain't never going to be nothing. 
this is the best you're ever going to feel. It's better than the way it was, but it's the best you're ever going to feel. And I could judge me. I could be my own judge, jury, and executioner, dying sober. And yet that day God moved into my life, and because my sponsor could see what I needed before I could see what I needed, and I didn't have to judge whether I had anything to give away the old-timers in this program, and God bless those old-timers, because they gave me what I needed to get out of myself. And that day that guy and I sat in my house, and we shared experience, strength, and hope. We didn't judge each other, and I got to experience another act of love that day. I got to experience the patience to listen but not hear. And I got to experience the apartness in our togetherness. I got to allow that guy to come into my life and me his, and we shared our deepest, darkest secrets with each other, and I let him leave. I don't let anybody leave when they know things about me like that. They can hurt me. And yet I let him leave. I let him walk out of my life that day, knowing that about me. That meant that my sponsor and another human being on the face of this earth knew those things about me. And yet there was a certain amount of feeling that I never experienced before in my entire life. And I knew for some reason that this thing worked. I had many reference points. I've got many reference points. When I was 54 days sober, I had a package that didn't belong to me. I'd been mulling some narcotics, and I stole a package. You know how we are? Let's take a little something for ourselves. <clears throat> and it made some people very unhappy. And when I'd been 54 days sober, I had to call these people up and return this package. And I met them in a parking lot. And I pulled up and I gave this package to these people. And I told them, here's your stuff. You know, I'm an alcoholic, dope fiend, whatever. i got to go to these meetings. And I'm you know, trying to walk a different way of life. And they said, get the hell out of our life. Don't call us. We'll call you. And I turned around and I walked back to my car that afternoon. And I... I didn't hear that click, and I didn't feel that thing that I knew had to come. I knew they were going to blow a hole in me the size of a watermelon. I was 54 days sober when I discovered one thing, one thing that's very important. Every good thing in my life is preceded by a wall of fear. I have to walk through that wall of fear before I can get the good in life, or I don't get it. That's why I drank and used, because the fear, the walls of fear were so great that I couldn't stand it. I had no trust in a power greater than myself, and I knew that money, property, prestige was my God. And yet when I came to the program of Alcoholics and on a sweetly reasonable, I was willing to do some of these things I could see little by little, but that, that there was some power greater than me. Taking care of my life because I had many, many reference points. Many reference points. You know, the amazing thing about this program is that there's something that's unbelievable. It works us when we can't work our, ourselves. You know, I came to this program and I worked the first five steps and I made a near-fatal mistake. I rested on my laurel. I rested on my laurels, and at six years, three months, and four days sober, something like that, I'm living a lie again. You see, it's one thing to live a lie. It's another thing to tell a lie. It's one thing to tell a lie, and it's another thing to live a lie. And at six years and a few days sober, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was going to have to make amends for some of the ways that I was making amends. And yet I had a way of life going sober that was beyond my wildest drunken dreams. It was a snowball headed for hell and didn't make any difference. See, because when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, I brought me. And if you're new or nearly new and you'd like to come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous and sit in these meetings and think that all you got to do is put the plug in a jug and everything's going to be fantastic, you're wrong. Because you will experience emotional pain that's beyond anything you ever experienced in your entire life growing up. And you'll have to stand and allow yourself to be what you're supposed to be. I'm grateful, you see, because since I come to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous for me, I've been working with a lot of them ding lines, you know. I mean, I got a lot of them weirdos, and I'd come home from their meetings, and I'd tell my wife, why do all the weird sick ones come to me, you know? <laughs> and I love the young people especially. I work with lots of young people, and, uh, and they're beautiful people. They've literally given me the energy to do the things that I've had to do, and I, I love them very much. And our house is full. We've got a home today. But at nine and a half years sober, I found myself standing in front of a judge one more time. And he's talking to me about me, and he's got the right guy. Nine and a half years sober, I'm standing in front of this judge. And he's talking to me about a way of life. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, 
I'm thinking about the things I've done nine and a half years sober because the alcoholic ego had revived itself. And I'm standing there and I'm thinking about, man, I can take him to a meeting where there's 50, 60 people I sponsor. I can take him and I can show him all the things I've done in Alcoholics Anonymous. I can take him down here to this banker and show him where I've paid all this money back at 20% interest. I can take him to this big house and show him where this lady and this little girl live. I can show him the big car in the driveway and I can show him people that will tell him that I've literally saved their life. And I'm standing in front of that judge full of self-righteousness and selfishness and self-centeredness because at nine and a half years sober, I forgot where I come from. I forgot how far it was from the county jail to here. And I'd taken credit for all those things. And it didn't make any difference. They weren't interested in that. And my lawyers told me to go home and get my house in order because it was a matter of time. A matter of time. And I'd develop to trust. You know, there's an amazing thing about sobriety, physical sobriety. You can develop a trust. People will learn to trust you because you're sober and you're doing things and you're showing up and that trust can be destroyed that quick because of the insanity of this disease. And I had people who had trusted me and I found something new. I found a way to make amends that I'd never experienced before in my entire life. I had to go home and I watched this lady and this little girl revert right back to the insanity that was there before. I saw the fear come right back into their lives. I saw that look in their face of, you've done it again. And I was consumed with the guilt and self-pity, sober, physically sober, but insane as could be. And I'm grateful for the old timers because the old timers literally took me by the hand and walked me through these things. I'm grateful for that there's old timers in this program that feel like nine and a half years is just as important as saving as nine and a half days because there is experiences there that can be shared. And I know today that it's necessary for me to go through these things or I would not have any experience, any strength, or any hope to share with a newcomer. If I just came to Alcoholics Anonymous and everything was wonderful and I started going to meetings with newcomers and I could share with them, I would have no experience, no strength, no hope. And yet I don't like change. I'm afraid of change. I'd much rather come here and rest on my laurel. You see, I made a mistake. I worked the first five steps and I stopped. I don't want to look at those character defects. I wanted to make amends by saying, I'm sorry, or how much you want me to write the check for. I had to stand in front of people and say, I'm wrong. You see, if you say you're wrong, you got to change. I don't want to change. And I had to stand in front of people and say, I'm wrong. Please don't judge the other people in your life by me and my actions. I'm wrong. And I've got to change and let it be and go about changing my life. You know, everything in my life had to fail me before I would come to you. And at ten years sober, nine and a half, ten years sober, everything in my life had to fail me before I'd go to my God. And that's exactly what the ABC says will happen to you. It's kind of a scary thought. And yet it's an unbelievable thing that transpires. And the old-timers told me, you've got to close the back door. You never close the back door. I'm happy to report I've closed the back doors. I'm free. I know a freedom today. I know what it is to wake up in the morning and feel good about life, to have an enthusiasm about life and sobriety that allows me to walk out there on the sunny side of the street and I hold my head up and I crawl before no one. I answer to my God. That's spiritual muscle. To be able to stand at somebody and look them in the eye and know that I'm as sober as I am secret. I got no secrets. I got no secrets. Even the things that are secret to me are not secret to you. And what that means is, is that I don't have to have everyone's approval in order for me to feel good about me. I know there's people in Alcoholics Anonymous of all kinds. There's people in Alcoholics Anonymous that I wouldn't have drank with. And there's people in Alcoholics Anonymous I don't share my sobriety with. But there's people in Alcoholics Anonymous who've walked down that road right beside me and they're willing to share those experiences. There's people that I sponsor that have the faith and the strength and the hope that what I'm doing is right and they follow and they literally push me when I'm going through my thing. And then that time comes when I have no defense. They literally push me with their experience and their strength and their hope. And it literally pushes me through those walls of fear. And I might get on the other side and develop that strength and to know the trust in a loving God that works in my life 
when I don't even understand it. See, I don't understand those things. All my life I wanted to be the meanest man on the face of the earth. I really did. I had all the toys. I had all the tools. I had all the images. I had all the acquaintances. I had all the places. And I didn't even know what it was to be the meanest man on the face of the earth. Today I know what it is. If you want to know what he looks like, you're looking at him. He's that little guy who lives down the street and he has a wife and a kid or a dog and a cat and he can get up in the morning and go take a shower and put a clean set of threads on and he can walk in the kitchen and put his arms around his wife and say, I love you, baby, you mean something to me. And he can walk across that room and he don't have to kick the dog or the cat. And he don't have to yell at the kid. He can put his arms around the kid and say, I love you, baby. I hope you can walk on the sunny side of the street. And he can go out and get in that car and he can go down the street and he don't have to flip the crosswalk lady off. And he can go and work with them crap heads all day long and he can get that paycheck and he can bring it home at night and he can put it in that bank and he can pay the bills and he can lay down at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and take a little nap even. I mean, that's a spiritual awakening. And he can go to a meeting at night and he can laugh and cry and kiss him goodbye and he can come home at night and put his head on that pillow and he can thank some loving God for another sober day for the simplicity to just to be a spoke and a wheel, not a big deal. And he can lay there in that bed and know beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is some power some power greater than him that allowed him to walk on the face of the earth. It takes guts to do that. It takes guts to do that. I'm glad when I walked in the meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, some dude come up to me and punched me right in the chest, and he said, I hear you're a bad dude, Ace. He said, if you think you're tough, let's see you stay sober. Any puke can go get drunk. And he wasn't kidding, baby. It takes balls to stay here and stay sober. It'll take everything you got and then some to make it. Fifty percent of the people in this room today, if you be alcoholic, will die drunk. And I can stand at that door back there when this is over and say, will it be you? Will it be you? And probably half the al will die as a direct result of some relationship with a drunk. It's not pretty. It's not PTA time. It's not fun and games. And yet it's a way of life that allows you to enjoy everything you ever wanted to imagine. It allows you to have the enthusiasm about living and enjoy the whole package. To walk out there and smile and look them in the eye and know beyond a shadow of a doubt you're right where you're supposed to be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing and you got no images, no big deals to defend. you got nothing but yourself. Feeling of cleanness and openness. I got that. I know I got that. Because ever since I woke up this morning, man, I've seen them all. I've seen the tall ones and the short ones and the rich ones and the poor ones. And from the second I woke up to this second right now, I've not seen anybody or thought of anybody I'd rather be than me. God, that's freedom. That's a freedom beyond my wildest drunken dream. Just to be me. And I got some things I know I love very much. I know I love that blonde-headed lady. I love her beyond anything I ever imagined. Because there's never been a day since I've come to this program of Alcoholics Anonymous that she's resented the method of my recovery there has never been a night when she'd say, stay home with me, you don't need a meeting. She has always supported my sobriety and that little girl, I love her very much. She's 24 years old and she may be a grown woman to some people, but she's daddy's little girl to me. And today she's a professional model and she lives in Milan, Italy and she's in love with a little short, fat Italian that looks like her old man. <laughs> and she loves me and she loves you. She's very active in the program of Al-Anon, and she's been able to look beyond where other people have feared to go. She's been able to achieve her dreams. You see, that's not a, that's not a success story. That's a miracle. There's no success stories here. It's literally a miracle. You cannot go from that kind of being to what we are today. That is spiritual. It is a way of life. Nothing else. I just switched obsessions from drinking and using to a way of life. What a fantastic obsession. I get to enjoy it all. I never wanted anything less than all of it anyway. And I enjoy it all. I've got to stand here for the last hour or so and I got to experience all the feelings that I wanted to stuff something down in there and keep from feeling. I got to ex stand here and experience happiness and joy and sorrow and excitement. A little bit of anger and a feeling of living. Man, if you're not enjoying those things, I don't know what you got to do, but God's sakes, keep coming back. You may not want what I got, for God's sakes, keep coming back until you want what you got. Because it's all about feeling and enjoying this whole deal and letting something happen inside of you. 
You know, I can stand in front of that mirror in my home in the morning, and I can look at something. I can look at me in that mirror, and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, there's somebody home. There's somebody home. There's something looking back at me, and it's alive. And it feels. It feels today. There's not some weird, insane thing looking back at me that knows no faith, no trust. There's a way of life, and I see it. There's many, many words in this program and in the big dictionary. And I don't know how to explain any better than a story that I heard, and I'm going to share it, and I'm going to shut up. There's a story of a little cobbler man. The cobbler man was a beautiful man, and he died, and he went to heaven. When he got to heaven, he was standing in front of God, and God said, Cobbler man, you know, you were a beautiful man. You worked hard all your life, and all your life you worked and gave everything you had to your family and to your community. The only thing was, all your life you never really believed in a God. And the cobbler thought, and he said, Well, you know, God, if I could have just seen you one time, or maybe if I could have just heard your voice once, or maybe if I could have just touched you one time, I would have believed 100%. And the God said, Well, you know, Cobbler, you remember one day, it was a real snowy day, there was snow on the ground, it was real cold, and you were working in your shop, and you looked out the window, and a little girl was coming walking down the street, and you went over, and you got her, and you brought her into your shop, and you set her down, and you, she was cold, and you put your coat around her, and you took her shoes off, and noticed she had holes in her shoes, and you fixed the soles on her shoes, and you put her shoes back on, and you warmed her up a little bit, and you had to go back to work, and you were working, and pretty soon you heard a little rustling noise, and you looked up, and the little girl was just about to walk out the door, and when she got right in the middle of the door, she stopped, and she turned, and she smiled at you. And the cobbler told God, yeah, I remember that. I remember that day. And God said, well, I'll tell you another time. You remember one day you were working in your shop, and there was an old bum come down the street. And he came in and he needed some money. He asked you if you could have some money so he'd get some to eat. You didn't have any extra money, but you had a couple of sandwiches in your lunch bag. And you told him if he'd sit there on the bench, you'd share one of your sandwiches with him. And he sat down and you sat down. And he ate his sandwich and you ate yours and there wasn't a word spoken. There was a special silence. And when he finished your lunch, you got up and you went back to work. Pretty soon you were working away and you saw the bum move and he stopped just as he got to the counter and you looked at him and he reached across the counter and he shook your hand and the cobbler told God yeah I remember that day when that bum shook my hand he said well you remember one day there was a little old lady come down the street and she was lost and confused and she was crying she stopped at your shop and she came in you got her calmed down you found out her son was up the street and you went and got him brought him down and everything was okay and you went back to work and time for her to leave and she stopped just as she was going out the door and she said bless you my son and the cobbler told God yeah I remember that God said, well, the little girl's smile was my smile, and that bum's handshake was my touch, and that little old lady's bless you, my son, was my voice. I was there all the time. You just couldn't see, and you couldn't hear, and you couldn't feel. Now, on any given day, if I want to remember a smile, if I want to remember a smile on that little girl's face, like I saw not too long ago, when she came home to tell me that she loved me, she came home last Christmas, and she's a beautiful little girl, and she's done what she always wanted to do. She's fulfilling the dream. And my house is in order, and my amends are made. And there's an openness and a freedom there that allows her to be my daughter and me her father, and that's all it's supposed to be. And she walked back down that ramp going up on that plane to go back to Italy. She stopped, and she turned, and she looked at me, and she smiled at me. <laughs> If I want to believe that's my God smiling at me, man, I can believe it. You bet. And on any given day when my old man and I are standing together, two sober members of this program, but the steps and the amends have made us what we're supposed to be, father and son. When my old man puts his arms around me and he holds me like a father is supposed to hold a son, when he holds me tight and I feel safe and I feel comfortable, I want to believe that's my God's touch. I can. I can. Or any given morning like this morning. Early this morning I woke up, and that blonde-headed lady sitting, laying there in that bed next to me. And there's a quietness in that room. And I hear that small voice inside of me. And I know to hear no screaming, and I don't hear no flesh pounding flesh, and I don't hear no sirens, and I don't hear no sobbing. I hear a small voice that's comfortable and a peace. And I feel the quiet heart. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt 
when she whispered in my ear, I love you, baby, I love you, that it's true. If I want to believe that's my God talking to me, I can. Now, you might say that's not right, but you can't say I'm wrong because I'm sober and I feel good about me. And that's the deal. That's the whole deal. Not no more, not no less. It's that simple. If I don't get no more than that, I'm overpaid. I'm overpaid. I came here to a place like this, a stupid place like Alcoholics Anonymous, where we laugh at all the wrong things and we cried at the wrong time. And you told me, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you're welcome. You're welcome. Come in and let us love you into the person you always wanted to be. You see, you came here and you gave me my God. And I'm grateful today that my God gave me you. Thank you. God bless. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.